Hello everybody, my name is Marco Micheli and in this talk I'm going to introduce you to what asteroids are and why they are dangerous for us and in particular what we are doing in ESA to take care of the danger of asteroids by doing all we can to predict and mitigate the threats that can come from these objects. Let's start with an introduction to what asteroids are. The object you see on the left is a very typical asteroid. As you can see, it looks like a rock, it looks like a piece of stone. It's kind of irregular in shape, and most asteroids, especially the small ones, look like that. The one to the right, on the other hand, it's uh, more or less spherical, and it's the largest of the asteroids we know in our inner solar system. It's about a thousand kilometers in diameter. In terms of sizes, they go from this one, a thousand kilometers, down to very, very small sizes, down to basically pebbles. Now I want to tell you where asteroids are in our solar system. What you see here is an animation of the solar system. Each of the white circle is the orbit of one of the planets, starting from Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars, and out here the orbit of planet Jupiter. Each of the little dots you see is the position of a known asteroid. As you may notice, the vast majority of them are in this area, between the orbit of Mars and the orbit of Jupiter. This is what we call the main asteroid belt, and these asteroids are the ones we don't really care about. They stay far enough from our planet, from the Earth, to not pose a threat to us. However, you can see that there are a few of the dots in here that actually come close to the Earth. These are the near-Earth asteroids, and these are the ones we care about because they are the ones that pose a threat to our planet. And to show you directly why that's a threat, I'm going to show you this video. This video was taken by people who were going to work in Russia uh, in 2013. What you are seeing there is an asteroid coming through the Earth's atmosphere, getting brighter and brighter, and then exploding, more or less at this point. What you don't see in the video is what happened about a minute or two after this explosion. The explosion happened in the atmosphere about 20 kilometers up, and it created a huge massive shock wave. And this shock wave propagated through the atmosphere until it reached the ground over the city that is under it, the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. The result was pretty major. The shock wave was so powerful then that a lot of buildings, fragile buildings, uh, industrial buildings or roofs fell down, windows were shattered and about 2,000 people actually got injured by the event. Fortunately, nobody died, but it was still a pretty major destruction for the city. And the asteroid that was cap capable of causing such damage on a major city was only 20 meters in size. So this gives you an idea of how powerful these asteroids are, even the small ones, even one that's just 20 meters in size. What you see here, on the other hand, is what happens when a 40-meter asteroid hits the Earth. This happened about 50,000 years ago, in what today is the southwest of the United States. And uh, the hole you see there is about a kilometer in diameter. The difference between the previous video and this one is that in this case, the asteroid was not truly a rock, it was actually a piece of metal. And as you may imagine, metal is harder and it survives most of the entry to the atmosphere. So instead of exploding high up in the atmosphere, most of this asteroid reached the ground and basically punched a big hole in the ground. And this is the result of that punch. About a kilometer of a hole, there is actually some trace of the asteroid itself in the crater and all around in the form of small little pieces of metal, of sharpen, and these are meteorites generated by the asteroid impact. This image, on the other hand, shows you a forest, actually what remained of a forest, see a lot of trees that are basically kicked to the ground by something. This is the result of an explosion that happened in 1908 in uh, Siberia, what today is Russia. The explosion was caused by, again, an asteroidal object of 
think of about 50 meters in diameter that again entered the atmosphere and exploded in the atmosphere itself creating this shock wave that hit the ground and the result was about a radius of 70 kilometers around the, the explosion point that was basically completely devastated fortunately it was a remote area nobody lived there it took about a decade for people to actually go there and uh, investigate what happened but this is what a 50 meter asteroid can do can destroy 70 kilometers of radius around the impact point so now just, just imagine if the same thing were to happen above a populated city about a major uh, urban environment the most famous of all asteroids is probably the one that about 66 million years ago fell on what is today the yucatan peninsula in mexico and it was a big one it was about 10 kilometers in size and it left a big crater about 100 kilometers in size but most importantly it was responsible for what we today know as the extinction of the dinosaurs and about 70 percent of all living species on earth at the time this was a massive asteroid 10 kilometers as i said but if you compare it with the size of the earth which is a thousand times larger it still gives you an idea of how something relatively small in comparison with the size of a planet can completely devastate the whole planet and cause an ecological disaster on planetary scale now the previous images gave you an idea of how much damage an asteroid can cause now I'm going to give you a measure of the numbers with this plot and invite you to just focus on the bottom row of this table this area this is a set of histograms that tell us how many asteroids are there of each given size bin and uh, how many we know of if you look at the rightmost side of the plot you see the large ones the ones that are bigger than a kilometer and uh, you see that we know about 98 percent of the ones we think exist 914 out of 930 and that's reassuring it means that we've spotted almost all the major ones and we know that at least for the next century or so it's highly unlikely that a big massive asteroid can come and hit our planet and cause the kind of devastation that happened to the dinosaurs however if you go to smaller scales you see a very different scenario for example these are 100 to 300 meter asteroids these are still pretty big these are still objects that can cause significant damage to a country and as you can see we think there are about 30,000 that can come close to the earth and we know about 5,000 of them so in this case we are far from being complete and there could be objects of this size scale that can be coming right now towards us and we need to have telescopes and uh, projects to be ready to observe them in time and uh, what is ESA doing the European Space Agency doing to prevent this to do our best to mitigate this threat well it opened a program that deals with threats from space to earth and uh, they've identified a few threats the threat of artificial objects falling on the earth the threat of the sun releasing energy towards the earth and affecting the earth and the threat from asteroids from near earth asteroids this third part is where i work and it's what i'm gonna talk to you about in this in the rest of this talk so the first step to do something about asteroids is to know that they exist and uh, to know they exist means to discover them the discovery of new asteroids is done today with what we call survey telescopes they are mostly automated telescopes that every night they scan the sky the night sky they take pictures of the sky and they look for anything that moves right now most of them are in the united states but ESA is building its own it's almost ready it will be installed in southern italy in sicily i hopefully in one or two years and it will be the European contribution to discovering new asteroids coming towards us discovering however is not enough the survey telescopes that I just presented to you they just spot the new asteroids and automatically tell the world they tell astronomers look there is a new asteroid coming from that direction but they don't keep an eye on them to keep an eye on the asteroids we need 
other telescopes, we need what we call follow-up facilities. And follow-up telescopes are typically bigger telescopes that are dedicated to monitor the most important new discoveries. Not all of them. Most of the asteroids that we will discover will be boring. They will be the ones between Mars and Jupiter. We don't really care about them because they're not a threat for our planet. But the fraction that are a threat, well, we need to keep an eye on them with the best technology we have. And uh, this is what these telescopes are for, among other things, obviously. One thing I want to point out, this is just three of these telescopes. You see where they are? There's like South America, North America, Europe. They're really all over the world. And this is really good. This is good for two reasons. Technically, it's good because sometimes we need to react very fast to an asteroid. And we need to have a telescope immediately available straight away to get the observations we need. And sometimes we may need to be in a particular area of the, of the Earth where it's dark, for example, or where the sky is clear. So we need access to telescopes that are distributed all over the planet. And the second reason why this is actually pretty good is that it shows that this is really a worldwide community. We at ESA in Europe, we are using telescopes that are literally all over the planet and people all over the planet are using telescopes everywhere, including in Europe, to make this a really truly coordinated effort among nations, among countries, and among space agencies all over the planet to do our best to get all the data we need to keep track of these asteroids. Now, as you may imagine, professional telescopes are not the same as the small telescopes you may have at home. You don't look through them with your eyes, you take pictures through them. And this is an example of a picture of the sky taken with one of the big telescopes that I've just shown you. You can see a lot of little dots that are stars and galaxies. Some of them are actually asteroids, but you don't see them, you don't recognize them because they look like stars. So in order for you to be able to spot the asteroid, magnify on this area of the image. I'm going to make it into a negative that shows better on screen, but most importantly, I'm going to make it a video. Now, instead of having one image, you have a sequence of images taken consecutively with the telescope. And now you see there is something different. There is something that moves there. So I'm going to do this as a little game for you, give you some time to spot the asteroids yourself. It's pretty simple. You just have two rules. Real asteroids move in a straight line, and real asteroids are visible in every image of the sequence. They don't appear and disappear. So there are four asteroids in this frame. Two are really easy, and I'm just going to point them out to you. Now your goal is to find the other two. I'm going to give you five seconds to think about, and then I'm going to show you the answer. Just uh, see if you, found, if you spotted them. So, if you are good, you should have seen a reasonably bright one right there in F6. And if you're really good, you may have seen another one that is much, much fainter down there in the corner, B8. The reason I'm showing this to you is not just because it's a kind of a fun game, but also because that's exactly what we astronomers do when we look at asteroid images you may be able to write a pro computer program that does this for you that looks for the moving asteroids but any computer program that we've been able to develop is not as good as the human eye we are still better at this the bright ones maybe the three brighter ones you could easily write some software to spot them the really faint one in the corner that one's too faint for machines but it is visible for our eyes we are still better adapted and more naturally skilled at this than any machine we've been able to develop. And I think that's a nice message to keep in mind. So why do we do this? We take these images and we spot these asteroids because the goal is to measure their position in the sky. We do this, that's called astrometry, not on one night, not just on just one image, but on different images taken on different nights. And uh, the result is to have Let's assume three different positions of the asteroid on three different nights in the sky. These three positions can now be used to estimate the motion of the asteroid in the sky and to fit what we call the orbit of the asteroid. So to de determine mathematically what is the trajectory of the asteroid in the sky, in the solar system. And that's useful because with this orbit, we can now predict the future motion of the asteroid. We can predict, for example, that tonight the asteroid will be there. 
but it's a prediction and it's an extrapolation, so it's not going to be perfectly accurate. It will have an uncertainty. We will know that the asteroid will be more or less inside the ellipse you see there. The goal now is that we take a telescope again and we point the telescope right there to cover that ellipse and we see where the asteroid really is. So let's assume it's there. It's not in the center, it's somewhere in the uncertainty. And this is good because now we have four points and now we can compute a much better orbit for the asteroid by going to the four points. And this orbit will allow us to predict the position of the asteroid in the future better and it will allow us to repeat the cycle over and over by again predicting, reobserving, and improving the orbit and improving the prediction. And this is the end result of all the work we do. This is what we call the risk list. It's a, a table of asteroids that we know where they are, but we cannot exclude that in the next century will come close enough to the Earth to be a threat. This table is taken from our website. I invite all of you to go to this website, neo.ssa.esa.int. And uh, in there, you find everything we produce at ESA to inform you, the public, and the scientists of the asteroid threat. The risk list, what you see here, is probably the main, the most important product. It has some tables. I'm just going to quickly explain to you what they mean. The main column is this one, is what we call the impact probability. The table is basically telling you that uh, for each of these asteroids, they have this probability of impacting the Earth on this date. And as you can see, well, this is actually just the top of the table. These are the top 10 positions. If you click down here, you can get the whole list, which is about a thousand asteroids right now. What this table is telling you is that, for example, this asteroid has a one in 14 ch chance of impacting the Earth in year 2095. But we're not really worried because it's actually a small asteroid. As you can see, it's only eight meters in size. So it will mostly disintegrate in the asteroid, in the atmosphere, even if it were to hit. And if you go to the table, you see there are some others, for example, this one, 700 meters, but it's a probability of less than one in a million. So we don't really care that much about it. And if you look at it, the table, you'll see that most of them are not really worrying us. Right now, we don't know of any asteroid that is really scary, that is really posing a threat to our planet. But we have been worried. We have been worried at least once in 2004 when astronomers found this little guy, which we now call Apophis. And uh, just after discovery, we did the same computations and uh, turned out that this object had a 3% chance of hitting the Earth in year 2029. So only 25 years after discovery. And Apophis is big. Apophis is about 300 meters in size. So it's something that can take out a small country, basically. So we had a 3% chance that 25 years in the future of the time, something could come and destroy a country on our planet. That was scary. So what happened? Well, astronomers used telescopes again, as I explained, to observe it and to get better data, and we could compute better orbits of it, for it. And the result was that Apophis is actually not going to hit us in 2029. We got lucky. It's going to come very, very close to our planet, though. And uh, I suggest you mark this date. If you have a calendar on your phone that goes to year 2029, mark the date in 2029, on the 13th of April, you will be able to see Apophis with your naked eye by just stepping outside your home, looking up, if it's clear. It will be so bright that it will be visible to the naked eye as a little star that moves across the sky. And it's a really unique event. So I suggest uh, that you do it when the chance comes because typically an asteroid comes that close and becomes that light, right only once every thousand years or so. So now you're good, right? Now you spotted there is another one there. Has it ever happened that an asteroid was spotted in the sky, predicted impact, and it actually did impact the Earth? Yeah, it has a few times. And the first time was in 2008, when this little asteroid was found, and it was predicted to be on an impact trajectory, colliding with the Earth only about 20 hours after discovery. It was fortunately a very small one, so nobody was really scared. But 
It's good because we could observe it more and predict exactly the impact point. It turned out to be in the north of Sudan, in the middle of the desert, where nobody lives, so that was reassuring. And uh, at the exact time that we predicted the asteroid was going to hit, meteorolo meteorological satellites like this one saw a little flash, you see this thing, it's a little flash of light coming exactly from the point where the impact had been predicted to occur. And a few days later, people went to the desert. Obviously, it's a pretty remote location, so it wasn't easy to get there. But they did find little pieces of rock that are what we call meteorites, and they have the remnant, the fragments of the asteroid that impacted on the Earth. And this is actually pretty good because it shows us that we can do everything. We can do the whole process from discovery to locating the impact point and to actually predicting exactly where and when the impact will occur. Now the question is, is there something we can do in case we spot a much bigger one coming towards the Earth? And the answer is yes, there is a technology and uh, it's actually reasonably simple in space terms. It's just uh, launching something heavy on the top of a rocket and smashing it on the asteroid to give it a kick. And this small kick might be enough, if we do it early enough, to change the trajectory of the asteroid a little bit and have the asteroid miss the Earth instead of hitting it. It's called Kinetic Impactor. It's a technology that NASA and ESA together are trying to test with a dedicated mission, which will target an asteroid called Didymos. And Didymos is actually pretty interesting because it's not a single asteroid, it's a binary asteroid. There is a main central asteroid and there is a little moonlet around it. The goal is that NASA will send a spacecraft smashing into the small moonlet. And uh, a few years later, ESA will send another spacecraft that will go there and uh, carefully analyze the system. This way, it will be able to accurately measure if the satellite of the system has been moved in its orbit around the primary object. And by seeing how much it has been moved, we will be able to directly estimate how effective the impact was. And this is very important because it's the kind of information we need in case we have an, another different asteroid coming towards us. And in case we need to mount a similar mission, we need to have a sort of a scaling measure to be able to estimate how big and how fast the projectile needs to be to cause the amount of deflection we need for this actually threatening asteroid to miss the planet. To conclude this presentation, I'm going to show you an image that may look like the ones you've seen before with an asteroid moving across the stars, but it's actually pretty different. What you're seeing there, it's not an asteroid, it's actually a car. You may remember that a couple of years ago, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and the founder also of SpaceX, the space company, wanted to test a rocket and to do so, decided to put a, his car on top of the rocket and fire it into space. The result is what you've seen in these images. This is Elon Musk's Tesla moving across the stars. The reason I'm showing it is to give you a scale of what telescopes can do. That's a car about a million kilometers away, away from Earth. So we actually have telescopes that can easily see something that small, that far away. And if we can see a car, we can actually see an asteroid of similar size and we can also see something bigger, maybe when it's even farther away. It gives you a sense of scale of how powerful these telescopes are. And then it's just a question of being there, spotting the right asteroid at the right time to be able to set up all the machinery you've seen and uh, put it in motion so that we can do something in case that object turns out to be threatening for our planet. Thank you very much. And now I'm ready to answer any question you may have for me about my presentation.